Hello everybody and uh, welcome to our webinar. My name is uh, Ciprian Tibia and I am the sales representative for the Baltics and uh, Romania and for Pristras for uh, worldwide. And uh, I am joined today by my colleague uh, Frederick Lagerstrom, who is also an expert and uh, developer of Pristras. So uh, during this uh, presentation, if you have any questions in regards to Pristras, please uh, uh, type it down and uh, Frederick uh, will answer it. Um, all right, so um, without uh, further ado, uh, let's start uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, so today we are going to uh, go through the design of a sloped I-beam. And we are just going to give this model a name. Of course, I believe that uh, many or most of you uh, are um, uh, acquainted with um, Pristress uh, user interface. So, um, uh, yeah, I will not go into too much detail about uh, uh, the user interface itself. This is um, the first window, actually the second after you selected the code, uh, that pops up as soon as you uh, open a new model. So um, here is the input data, as, uh, as we said. Um, so today, you see here, we have uh, different beam types. So it's a constant, a variable, uh, rectangular section, slope type beam, slope TT beam, multiple section, and straight type beam. Uh, so I will just choose the slope type beam, and uh, I will go to configure. And I guess this might be the place where most of you uh, have questions and uh, we will go through it it's really easy and intuitive i believe so we will select the first thing that we are going to do uh, we will um, uh, set the total length of the beam so in this case uh, we will go with 20 meters so um, half of the beam it will be 10 meters. Um, then by default, uh, this section is set to go from a um, rectangular section uh, on the beginning and the end, uh, and then um, uh, have a, a variable transition towards an I section, uh, while of course having a, a slope, in this case, one per 16. So uh, if we want, let's say to uh, decrease this uh, middle part. We, we don't want uh, uh, to have such a, a high thickness. We want to have a constant thickness. Uh, we just set this one to zero. And we set this one, for example, to 9,500. Then the transition part, let's say 150. And then we have basically uh, the uh, rectangular section in the start uh, for 350 millimeters and then 150 millimeters of transition and then we have an i beam uh, okay uh, if we want for example to avoid completely the rectangular part we can do that by setting zero here and setting 10,000 here so now basically this one is zero it doesn't have any any length and therefore uh, the entire section is is uh, uh, ib um so yeah let's go like this and oh i almost forgot how to change the uh, section properties so you see that we have here one uh, one and one two section so if i click one of those it will pop up this new window with all the dimensions that I can change for uh, my, my uh, uh, I-beam cross-section. For this example, we will just leave it like this. And the same for section 2, 2. All right, now let's just change a little bit the height, maybe 1.4 meters. 
it's more okay. Perfect. Now that we have set the geometrical details of our section, we just click the add button and we click OK. So our beam has been uh, created. I just want to see if whether indeed I have a nice section at the end. So as you see, this is the very end of the beam. It's a nice section. It's no longer a rectangular section. Uh, we get this question a lot, so uh, that's why I wanted to, to tackle this uh, uh, issue and uh, discuss it. Okay, so now it's basically uh, the same steps that we take in uh, normal uh, beam design. So we will just go through the steel rough reinforcement. We just choose the default placing. We go to reinforcement details just want to check it maybe we want to use the regular spacing layer uh, calculation uh, we skipped the fire uh, in this case and the calculation uh, sections in case you need a specific section that is, is not included in this table you can add it manually all right so um, going through the longitudinal reinforcement, let's set some uh, layer of reinforcement. So we set two bars on top. And uh, let's say five or maybe six. Let's go overboard. And here five. Okay, so I added three layers of uh, uh, tendons. Okay, each tendon is a diameter 12.9. Uh, it has a full length spanning from the beginning to the end, and uh, uh, it is pre stressed with uh, 1300 megapascals. Uh, and of course, as you see here, uh, there is uh, uh, no uh, reinforcement for the top bars. Uh, no, sorry, no pre-stressing force. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's go to load case. Actually, before we go there, let's look a little bit uh, at uh, our... Um, uh, general data, so exposure class, concrete class, etc. So let's switch it to moderate humidity, and then uh, the final uh, um, <clears throat> class is C40, uh, as you see here, and it slowly progress uh, from the release phase to storage and maturing. Uh, and then reaching its final class uh, uh, in transport uh, stage. Okay. Uh, now, if I go to uh, the input loads, I see that uh, I only have uh, this self-weight. Uh, so I need more load cases. Let's say permanent one. and the live load. All right, so now I have defined uh, uh, two more load cases. If I change it, I, I see that I have to apply it. So uh, yeah, permanent, let's take that from the intermediate stage. We place, uh, uniformly distributed load of 10 kilonewtons per meter. And we do that for all the stages following the intermediate stage. <clears throat> and then we switch back to the live load and we place that in the final stage, let's say with 15 kilonewtons per meter. I don't know, this this might be a total uh, uh, bogus, but uh, is, you know, just an example, an academic example, you can call it. So uh, it doesn't have to resemble reality. We just want to 
uh, tackle some issues that you might encounter in your day-to-day uh, -day designs. Okay, so um, now we place all the loads. We can have an overview like this uh, if I click the load combination and I go through uh, all of the load cases individually. So um, if I maximize again the window, I need to change the load combinations accordingly. So I added the permanent load in the intermediate stage. Then I added the uh, live load in the final stage. So uh, yeah, I'm just changing the uh, load combinations as well. Uh, I say this in, in all my webinars because I know in some specific areas, uh, the load combinations used might slightly be different. Uh, so uh, just bear in mind that we can um, easily modif uh, modify any uh, combination with any safety factor. So for example, from 1.15, I can make it 1.5 and I just click change and uh, yeah, it's changed. So keep that in mind. Um, all right, <clears throat> in our previous webinar, we have discussed about um, creep and shrinkage. So um, uh, the creep and shrinkage tab is here and uh, I encourage you to use it. Um, we can um, easily uh, you know, find it if we type Strusoft creep and shrinkage. It will take you here. And uh, this is a free to use page, so you can easily calculate your creep and shrinkage coefficients. Um, so yeah, check out our uh, uh, previous webinar. We have a recording on uh, on YouTube and uh, you can find out uh, all the details of creep and shrinkage. For this example, we will just uh, skip it since it was discussed uh, uh, there. Uh, right. Uh, so now, we have modified uh, uh, our uh, load combinations. Uh, in case we want to move the position of the supports, we can do that as well. They are placed in a, a default uh, uh, position as uh, uh, we think most uh, factories are, are using, especially you know, in, the, in the storage and maturing and uh, transport uh, stage. Uh, but of course, you can modify the position uh, of, of uh, every uh, support in any stage. Okay, uh, so let's go to uh, calculation and see if whether we went overboard with uh, our loads or not. So it gives me an, uh, a warning that I have uh, invalid cover. Uh, I just ignore it for the moment and uh, see if whether it causes any problems or not. All right, so here we have our moments. Uh, then Torsion, of course, we don't have any. Shear force. Then actual force and deflection. So I see I have quite a bit of deflection. But let's see what, uh, what happens actually when I do the design. So if I go now to the design and uh, calculate code control, It will uh, basically code check uh, every stage and I can have an overview of my design and uh, uh, yeah, we will see. In this case, it wasn't that good as you can notice uh, with, from, from the red uh, parts. So uh, yeah, let's see where we messed up. So I see that the compression stress uh, is uh, exceeding 
uh, is too is too high. Yeah, so 1.8 is quite higher. Uh, yeah, let's go further away. Still compression stress. Here, yeah, let's say the, the moment capacity, I would aim a little bit higher for uh, an optimal design. Much higher, actually. And I see that the shear capacity is exceeding. OK, so how do we solve all this? Well, we have multiple ways. If I go back to the first step, to, to geometry, um, I can either, you know, uh, decrease the pre-stressing force. That's one thing that I can do. Um, then, but then it's not really, you know, I don't take the full benefit of that tendon, and it might be a too expensive solution to do it like this. So I can change part of my tendons to passive reinforcement. That would be the second option. Um, I can just, you know, replace uh, tendons uh, with a higher diameter, uh, 25, for example, uh, uh, steel bar, uh, which, of course, will increase the overall uh, uh, capacity. Um, or I can, you know, use the non-adherent tubes and uh, uh, basically uh, distribute uh the uh, the pre-stressing force in different sections so i can have the first layer starting uh, from uh, uh coordinate zero uh then i can have the the next uh, uh layer starting from uh, x coordinate uh, uh 1000 which is one meter inwards and the final layer i don't know maybe have a two meter non-adherent tube or 1.5 uh, and of course, I have also the option to uh, increase the, the section, but again, since we were looking at the uh, moment uh, capacity, we saw that that one was below, so we don't need a, a bigger section in that regard. So I will just, let's see if it works, right? So I will just delete this. And click OK, recalculate, and see if whether we have achieved something or not. Maybe it's still too much and uh, we need to do something else. We will go through the, uh, all those. Uh, you know, options that we have at our disposal at, uh, as designers, how to fix the, the issues. Okay, so I see that the red part has diminished, you know, graphically when looking at it, but let's see if whether we fix it or definitely needs a little bit of, of work. So I see that it's still too, too much. So I have 1.4. Let's look again to the last part. You see now the moment capacity is let's say where I want it, like 0 0.88, that's good. And 0 0.95, yeah. <clears throat> okay, the shear capacity is still a problem. So uh, we close it and we go back. We solve one problem at a time. So let's solve first the, the compression. I go to layer of reinforcement. And let's say I add five and five. Oh no, actually only five bars, right? So 
Okay, the last five tendons, I have to look with the Z coordinate, which is the higher. So are those five starting from 13, have Z 102 and ending at uh, uh, number 17. So what I want to do, I just want to change them to passive reinforcement. So it's wire, it's super strand. All right. I want to change it to B500. All right, now I have changed my uh, the last row of uh, tendons. I have to delete the pre-stressing force as <clears throat> I converted them from tendons to passive reinforcement and diameter 12 in this case. It automatically changed it when, when I changed the material properties from uh, uh, being a, a tendon to a passive reinforcement, the closest uh, uh, diameter was 12. Uh, all right. Uh, and uh, what else? Well, I can, you know, move because the fact that I added uh, some passive reinforcement doesn't change the fact that uh, I still have too much compressive uh, 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 force. So I can try and see if whether I add some non adherent tubes uh, for the second layer. Uh, so second layer with, with uh, a Z coordinate 69, and I will change the starting position like one meter inwards. The reason why it made uh, uh, all those bars red is because they still have uh, 20 meters length. So if I want my bar to start one meter inwards and go, let's say, uh, end one meter uh, inwards at the end side, I have to change it 18 meters. So I do this for all the red bars and now they turn white again because my bars are inside the, the concrete beam and they are not sticking outside. Okay. So, yeah, this is the second modification that uh, we can do as a designer. <clears throat> so the, the road to optimal design is, you know, with incremental steps, you get closer and closer until you have the, the uh, result that you were searching for. Okay, so we still have one tiny part of red uh, zone, but yeah. Let's check the numbers and see how far are we. So I see it dropped to 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, okay, so one other modification that we can do is basically change these to five. Okay. And then, yeah, I have to change again because <laughs> uh, it changed everything and uh, redo uh, my passive bars to tendons. So sorry about that. I could have changed it in a, in a different way. Just going to take a little bit longer, so you have to bear with me. Yeah, 
uh, and uh, I lower the numbers. So another thing that I can do, I can maybe lower the pre-stressing force, let's say from 1,300 for the second row to 1,100 megapascals. Yeah, so now it should be fixed, right? So let's calculate it. Now we will tackle the, the shear faults. And uh, yeah, so now I see everything is green. It's the way we like it. So uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, go check, storage and metering. Now I see it dropped from uh, yeah 1.1 to 0 0.82. So indeed we solved the, the uh, exceeding uh, uh, compression capacity but we might run into a different problem now with uh, uh, no it looks like we are still in in a good place in terms of moment capacity uh so yeah all that is left now uh, according to to uh, this uh, overview is to uh fix the shear so yeah let's look at the shear so I see that it's 1.36 1 uh, design section uh, 0.88. Yeah, so um, there are several things that I uh, forgot to mention. One would be the end zone reinforcement. Uh, so if we go back to geometry, and we look in inside the stirrup reinforcement see here that we have n stirrups and uh, it also saying that uh, these stirrups will not show up uh, in the main stirrup list and you will not be able to see them in a, in a graphical manner uh, so if i click this i can select the diameter i can select the material of course cover distance between them and number of legs so sorry um let's say eight legs and uh a diameter 10. yeah okay and i want to have a more dense stirrups since it's just one leg per stirrup uh let's say 150. Right. So, yeah, maybe it's overkill 150, 200. Okay, so now we are hoping to uh, solve this uh, uh, share without uh, the need to, you know, increase the section. So of course the the first thing that we are going to do is is uh, increase the uh, shear reinforcement. And it looks like we made it. So, uh, yeah. Let's go directly to last stages. Shear capacity 0 0.83. Shear capacity 0 0.906. So 
now I would say we are in a in a, in a good spot uh, in terms of uh, design. We still have a little bit of, of reserve uh, in terms of capacity, both in shear and in in moment. Uh, we are over 0 0.9, uh, which for me at least uh, uh, it 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 says that it's a good design, right? So uh, uh, yeah, we managed to fix our beam. Uh, starting from a complete mess with our initial uh, uh, reinforcement setup, and we ended up with uh, with a good design. Now, of course, this is an overview, so uh, uh, we can look at the results, you know, in a in a much uh, uh, deeper way, like uh, table bending, shear, crack data, etc., uh, and reinforcement. Uh, so yeah, the software will will give us all of this and uh much more and uh, if we are satisfied we can just go to to printing and uh it will create pdf with uh, all of the uh, results uh you know so yeah uh i hope uh, that my colleague frederick uh, was able to uh, answer all of your questions and uh, uh if there are still questions that uh, remained unanswered, uh, we will do so uh, during, uh, you know, the upcoming days uh, uh, through email, depending on, on the complexity of the question. And uh, uh, yes? there is a quite common uh, question that I would like to answer, if possible. Yeah, uh, of course. And uh, if you uh, close this uh, here, and uh, it is with regards to the compression stress uh, and when we looked at the results we could see that the compression stress was uh, quite high and that was one of the things that uh, you uh, checked there but there is also an, a third possibility or a fourth uh, and if you go into the input geometry yes. and we open up the beam uh, there and go to storage maturing uh, there we go and uh, after a calculation has been performed or initial uh, calculation has been performed there is one option on the right hand side called prevention of longitudinal cracks can be avoided according to if you check that uh, the uh, compression limit uh, increased from 0 0.45 to 0 0.7 but uh, that is also that you need to make uh, a verification or a visual verification in the factory uh, that there are no cracks along the uh, pre-stressing strands um, because they need the uh, anchorage and if there are any of these cracks uh, then uh, you are not allowed to use uh, 0 0.7. So if we check this and then make a calculation, uh, if you calculate the beam now. Yeah, uh, it, uh, uh, it probably uh, going to decrease, right? Uh, <laughs> I mean, not probably. Well, for sure. well uh, we will just check the, uh, um, storage maturing load case uh, or load combination results here so yeah uh, this is one thing that but then you really need to uh, uh, specify on the drawings and have uh, verifications and to uh, basically say that yes i am allowed to use this because there are no cracks uh, so um, yeah uh, we will now check the uh, uh, code check. Do you want me to? Yep. Yeah. Uh, storage maturing. And here we now can use up to 70% of the uh, compressive stress, uh, the first compression stress check. So uh, this is also uh, another. Uh, uh, check yeah. and it's uh, not 
possible to show both uh, because we are uh, uh, in the calculations we are uh, uh, either limiting it to 0.45 or use up to 0.7 so uh, it's uh, uh, not possible to show both here so this check box is basically to say that yes i have been utilizing the higher capacity which means that i need to have uh, this um, check performed uh, in the manufacturing yes thank you All right. uh Okay, guys. So uh, I hope that uh, you enjoyed our uh, our webinar. Please note that uh, we also have another big news in Strosoft, like we released uh, Fun Design uh, uh, 23. And uh, yeah, go check that out. Uh, we will also have a um, uh, paid pre-stress uh, uh, webinar upcoming soon. You will find it uh, all the details in uh, in our website. So those of you that are here uh, and have registered for for this webinar will gain free access uh, the webinar will probably be in the in the near future so uh, two or three weeks maximum one month uh, we don't have a specific uh, date set at the moment but uh, follow it through uh, ask for a, a trial uh, or maybe, I don't know, if you want to use it uh, during the, the webinar, ask for a trial uh, in one week. And uh, yeah, I hope I, I'll see you there and that you you take advantage of this uh, opportunity that we, we made for you. So thank you again. And uh, yeah, see you. Bye-bye.